I'm Greg Pauley, and I'm the curator of reptiles and amphibians and the co-director of the Urban Nature Research Center at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. At the Natural History Museum, we have over 35 million historical objects and research specimens in our collection. For these research specimens, they have information about where and when that particular species was collected. And that information can be used for a variety of different studies that focus on climate change. At NHMLA, we recognize that climate change is an undeniable fact. Our paleontological collections help to demonstrate that the Earth's climate has been changing through time, but we also recognize that the current rate of change is exceptional, and that is largely because of human activities. Many of the more recent specimens housed at the Natural History Museum were collected over the past century. These specimens provide a snapshot looking back in time that tells us about the range of a particular species in the recent past. We can now conduct modern day biodiversity surveys and compare our modern day records to those historical museum records to understand how species ranges are shifting through time and therefore how they're responding to various factors such as climate change or urbanization. One of the ways we go about getting modern biodiversity data is actually asking people all across Southern California and elsewhere to pull out their smartphones and their digital cameras and to take photographs of plants and wildlife that they might see and then upload those observations to the community science platform iNaturalist. By doing so, those records can then be compared to our historical museum records to assess how species ranges are shifting. And importantly, the records that we're generating today also are providing a baseline for scientists of the future so that they will have a huge amount of biodiversity data available to conduct their own studies of how species are responding to climate change. So I want to give you a few examples of how climate change factors into some of the research that I do. So when I first started at the Natural History Museum, one of the specimens that just completely blew me away um, when I first saw it you know, in, within the herpetology collections was a yellow-bellied sea snake. And this wasn't just any yellow-bellied sea snake. This was a particular specimen that washed up on an Orange County beach. It was actually found Thanksgiving morning in 1972. And at that time, and up until just a few years ago, this was the only yellow-bellied sea snake ever documented in California. Now, the yellow-bellied sea snake is it's a really amazing snake. It is only found in oceanic waters. So if this animal gets washed up onto the beach, it actually can't even it can't even crawl back into the water. Its its body is so adapted to this fin-like structure that allows it to be a great swimmer that it actually can't move that well on land. This is the most wide-ranging species of snake in the world. It occurs throughout the warmer waters of the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. So it goes the east coast of Africa to the west coast of the Americas. But in terms of thinking about its distribution along the Pacific coast of the Americas, it only gets as far north as about the southern tip of the Baja California Peninsula until this specimen was found in 1972. Now, if you think about climate change, of course, one of the things that we expect is that we expect ocean waters to be warming. And given that expectation, the first species that we expect to be able to respond to that are those, those are the pelagic species, so the species that are found sort of moving around in open water. And the yellow-bellied sea snake is actually also sometimes called the pelagic sea snake because it is this open water specialist. And so that first specimen showed up in 1972, but just in the past few years, five more specimens have been documented off the Southern California coast. So what we see is exactly as predicted. We see that ranges of this pelagic species are actually responding to these warming waters. It's not just the yellow-bellied sea snake that we're seeing shifting in its distribution off the Southern California coast. There's also pelagic seabirds like the brown booby, which just started breeding for the first time ever documented um, right here off the Southern California coast out on the Channel Islands in the recent last few years. And then we also see a number of pelagic fish that are moving northward, including a number of sport fish that are drawing people to, to go sport fishing off the Southern California coastline. So... That's one way in which some of these distributional records are, are able to inform how species are responding to climate change. Now, climate change impacts a huge diversity of you know, many different aspects of sort of the biology of various species. So one of the things that I started dealing with some of these iNaturalist observations is actually not just using them to study when and where a particular species was found, but actually using the content of that image to study that species as well. And I got particularly interested in using those images to study mating behavior in alligator lizards. So each spring um, for our local southern alligator lizard and further north the northern alligator lizard, the male alligator lizard, um, the adult males will go up to a female and will bite that female sort of on her head neck region. And they'll maintain that bite hold for a prolonged period of time, sometimes several days. And if people see that, they can upload photos 
Um, they can either email them directly to the museum or they can upload these photos to this iNaturalist platform. And after running this project for several years, we, of course, during the last few years, we've had years with, um, in some cases, record drought, and in other years, we've had decent rainfall. And one of the things that we, that we quickly saw was that in those drought years, we received about one-third the number of observations of this mating behavior as we did in years that had decent rainfall. And the reason that this is significant is that you know, under many climate change models, we expect increasing numbers of drought, we expect increasing variability um, in our overall weather. So some years above average rainfall, other years, you know, sort of drought years. And so that could have a huge variety of impacts on species. And so it looks like one of the impacts that we're seeing is that it's having an impact on the number of individuals that are actually mating. And in these years that we see very few individuals mating, what we also see is that in the, in the midsummer when we typically see hatchlings is that in these drought years, we see very few hatchlings as well um, midsummer. So what this tells us is that as we start to see this increasing variability in weather, um, longer, more prolonged droughts, that that's gonna have a number of downstream impacts, including in the case of the southern alligator lizard, potentially greatly reducing their reproductive activity in those drought years, which then could have long-term impacts on the stability of some of these populations. There's a variety of ways that climate change is factored into a diverse types of, of ongoing research. And one of the things I wanna again highlight is that all of you can actually participate in studying biodiversity and participate in documenting some of the ways that climate change are impacting some of our local species. So you can also think about this as creating your own biodiversity data legacy. Um, you yourself can pull out your smartphone, pull out digital, your digital camera and start uploading observations to platforms like iNaturalist, creating the sorts of um, observations that researchers like me can use in, in our, our ongoing research, but also creating this biodiversity legacy that researchers of the future are then going to be able to mine in conducting future studies of climate change. Thank you.